stand up South Africa. Make sure that South Africa, you are counted with me. Run South Africa. Stand and make sure that our people understand that the need to be revolution in South Africa is guaranteed that under the EFF, this country will be the better. EFF is a COVID thing. Rishil Africa Zonga, Africa in the world. My name is Titus Tunga. I bring you this week's edition of the EFF podcast. Of course, we're coming to you from Winnie Madikizela Mandela House. With the election date being announced, uh, we shift focus now to the EFF 2024 uh, election manifesto. Uh, as you would know that on the 29th of May, uh, 2024. It is Freedom Day. We are heading uh, to the polls. Now, to get a sense of what the EFF uh, election manifesto for the 2024 uh, election year looks like, we are joined in studio now by the EFF MP uh, Vigil Fighter Vigil Kherike, uh, who serves in the Portfolio Committee, uh, the Parliament Portfolio Committee on uh, Police. Now he joins me. A very good morning to you, and uh, thanks for making time. Yeah, good morning to you, uh, Titus, and also mm-hmm. to the to the viewers. Mm-hmm. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, we're honoured to have you. Let's look at uh, Western Cape. Western Cape, it's I would like to believe an international tourist destination. But if you look at it, it's beset with challenges like crime. If perhaps we can look at the state of crime in the Western Cape. Yeah, crime is uh, escalating in the Western Cape. Mm-hmm. Uh, Western Cape is actually a crime hub uh, in contradiction of uh, what you read in elsewhere in the media. Oh, yes. uh, there's a lot of challenges on the ground, particularly in disadvantaged areas. Uh, and uh, where the focus should be on policing, on law enforcement, and so on and so on. Uh, At the moment, the Western Cape is governed by the Democratic Alliance Mm -hmm. and by the Democratic Alliance alone. And their agenda agenda is simply to focus on your inner city. Uh, And if you go into the colored and black areas, for instance, of the Western Cape, you will see there's a lack of law enforcement. Uh, There's a lack of policing uh, there's a lack of infrastructure development, and uh, there's a lot of social ills and challenges when it actually comes to fighting crime and policing. There's also this thing of, uh, you know, municipal budgets uh, and then the uh, allocation of budgets towards fighting crime, mm-hmm. uh, empowering law enforcement units to fight crime and and, and, and social ills. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when it comes to allocating budgets, uh, there's little that you see that actually goes to the uh, disadvantaged communities. Uh, In most cases, those communities are dependent on grant funding from national government. And you actually don't see, if you do the uh, scrutinizing of the budget, uh, you don't see that they actually allocate from their own tax monies and so on Mm -hmm. uh, towards fighting crime in those area status. Mm -hmm. And if you check the, the figures, in the last quarter of 2023, when you look at the police uh, stats, uh, Western Cape alone has recorded the highest uh, in terms of uh, MEDA. What, what could be the reasons behind this? And uh, why would a caring government uh, you know, allow this to happen? Yeah, there are multiple reasons. Mm-hmm. Uh, you cannot just pin it down to one particular reason. But multiple reasons, and here we talk about, the, the again, the social ills, the, the unemployment rate. Oh, yes. uh, people murder because they mm-hmm. want to steal. People murder because they are caught on the job to steal, mm-hmm. uh, and so on. Uh, unemployment, the, the, the level of inequality oh. is just massive. It's huge in the Western Cape. Uh, it, it is incredibly unbelievable to see the extreme rich uh, on the one hand and the extreme poor, on the other hand, there are many squatter camps. There are many informal areas. There are many, many hundreds of thousands of people without homes mm-hmm. uh, and proper shelter. Uh, and yes, those are all contributing factors uh, towards uh, you know the escalation of the crime rate. Mm-hmm. Uh, and therefore, uh, you know, the, the the focus should be on educating people. Uh, the focus should be on addressing the social ills. Uh, many of these ills uh, emanate, uh, as I said, social ills, 
Some of this will be, uh, for instance, uh, overpopulation mm -hmm. in a small little shack or uh, in a squatter camp, you know, uh, and people go out elsewhere to look for a better life. Uh, and uh, sometimes it, uh, origin, it, it, it escalates into crime. Mm -hmm. uh, but many social ills and the, 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 the government and all the local councils, they do little to, uh, to actually address the social ills in the communities in order to eradicate poverty, in order to address unemployment, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and to, uh, in order to, uh, to bring about integrated communities, uh, decent housing opportunities for people, uh, and bringing people out of squatter camps. Those mm -hmm. will be the contributing factors that will assist people mm -hmm. to get rid of crime, that will assist communities to get out of this uh, uh, cycle of crime, uh, and uh, the, 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 the development of the youth mm -hmm. is of critical importance because if you don't develop your youth, develop them in terms of education, de develop them in terms of skills development, mm -hmm. uh, you know, send them to tertiary uh, institutions. Uh, instead, many of the youth in the Western Cape, wherever you go, they turn to gangsterism and gangsterism gives them some kind of status in that specific community. And this is what they thrive on. Uh, but there are better things to look for uh, and to do in life, and that is to to upgrade your life uh, through education mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know formal education, skills development, and to become uh, a productive citizen uh, of your town and of your country. So yeah, they are the the DA. I mean, we're talking about people that are governing at the moment. We're not talking. We know we, we we're not shifting the blame to other parties. If you govern, you must take responsibility to improve the life of people mm -hmm. because this is what you said in the last election, you will improve the lives of people. Mm -hmm. Instead, people's lives are going backwards in the Western Cape. Uh, more people are homeless. More people are unemployed. I hear that the uh, at the SOPA, the Western Cape Premier said that the Western Cape is now counting for what, for 66 or 60% or, or, or of the of the jobs created in the last year or so. Mm -hmm. uh, I, 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 I'm here to see where they... Where they created those type of jobs. Mm -hmm. If we're talking about EPWP jobs, we're talking about temporary jobs. Uh, our people need permanent jobs. Our people need jobs where they can uh, reap some benefits, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like medical aid, like pension funds and so on. You cannot boast and brag uh, on EPWP jobs and those people are just lasting for three months and mm -hmm. six months and 12 months in those jobs. And then afterwards, they don't know. They're not even permanent. They are not permanent. Mm -hmm. that, is, that is the whole point. So I think we need to have a real look at those figures that the Premier has published uh, or what he has spoken about at the SOPA uh, because it baffled the mind. If you go into our areas in the Western Cape now, you will see on every corner you will find young people mm -hmm. in the droves. They are standing there. They have nothing to do. Uh, they are unemployed. Uh, and they are not even properly skilled to go into the job market. Mm -hmm. So I'm, 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 I, 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 I struggle to understand where did he gather, where did he draw his yeah. figures from? Yeah. That is the main problem here. Yeah. I think I would like to, to, to share the same sentiments as you because uh, I think Alan Windy, the premier of the Western Cape, was just playing to the gallery because if you look at the, the state of crime in the, in the Western Cape and the figures, of course, the, the, they've painted a bleak picture, but he has uh, come to the public to say they have efforts to curb uh, a crime and, in fact, crime has, in fact, uh, decreased. But if you look at the numbers, the numbers are contrary. So what, what would you say about or what, what could you draw from the state of the province address delivered by the uh, Western Cape uh, Premier? Would you say it's just a, 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 a pure lie? Yeah, well, <laughs> that is just a whitewash. Uh, it is uh, to impress upon. Look, we are in, on the verge of, of an election here. Oh yes, uh, it's a it, it's to impress upon the political and psychological mood of the citizens to vote for the DA again. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, nothing, nothing uh, uh, fundamental has changed in the lives of citizens, and people start to understand this. This is why the DA is standing at. Uh, 40 and under 40% at the moment in the Western Cape. Remember, they used to have 60%. Uh, uh, you can go and uh, research the polls. Mm -hmm. They used to have 60, 65%. They don't, no longer have it. They've, they, they, they came down right, straight down to 40. And there are some polls, uh, you know, bringing them to 32%. Yes. Because people start to understand their lies. Uh, people are exposing their lies. On social media, all over, people are exposing their lies. There is nothing so... 
uh, the, uh, so, uh, nothing so uh, radical that has changed in the Western Cape that you don't see elsewhere in the country. You mm -hmm. see unemployment. You see uh, homelessness. You see people living on the streets. You mm -hmm. see uneducated people. You see huge amounts of inequality. Those mm -hmm. are the type of things that we that we see here. Uh, talking about policing in the Western Cape, yeah, they are making a big case about the devolution of powers, and they want to devolve some of the powers of the police. Oh, uh, yeah. Yes, uh, yes, so that they can have their law enforcement guys to perform the duties and the functions of the police. Mm -hmm. It is unconstitutional, first and foremost, in the first place. And then secondly, they cannot even, by their own law enforcement officers in the city of Cape Town, they cannot even police the bylaws properly of the Western Cape, of Cape Town. Mm -hmm. And if we talk about the Western Cape, we're talking about George, we're talking about the Overberg, mm -hmm. uh, we're talking about Worcester, we're talking about all the other areas. They cannot even properly mm -hmm. police, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the bylaws uh, uh, that law enforcement officers are supposed to police. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is why you see this type of disarray in our communities. Yeah. Uh, people are just loitering. They are on the streets. Not, nobody is saying anything about it. They are robbing people. Uh, they are going around. There's uh, gangster activities all over on the streets of the Western Cape. And it's not safe for us. It's not safe for black people. It's not safe for colored people. The Western Cape is not a safe place. You can take it from me. I live mm -hmm. in the Western Cape. Uh, and uh, I'm a property owner in the Western Cape, over and above the fact that I'm a politician. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is not heaven on earth. I note that the... Uh, People are migrating from the north to the Western Cape uh, and they're paying huge amounts of monies for property in that area and so on. Under the false promises that the Western Cape is a safer place, that the Western Cape is more sorted out than all the other provinces, that is not true. If you come into our communities, in I'm talking about black and colored communities, you will see a different story. And this is which the media is not publishing. You will see a different story of, of, of the proliferation of squatter camps. You will see an increase in unemployment. You will see uh, uh, radical amounts, huge amounts of discrimination and inequality mm -hmm. amongst communities. On this mm -hmm. side, you will see squatter camps. On this side, you will see palaces of rich and wealthy and affluent communities. It is just... Uh, appalling to see, uh, you know, it, it's mind-boggling. You, 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 you don't want to see it. Uh, and then it brings you to this point to say, what then have they done to eradicate poverty, to eradicate unemployment, to eradicate all these inequalities? And in these times that they are governing the Western Cape, uh, it is just deteriorating. It's going backwards. It is not getting better for people of color in the Western Cape. It's getting uh, better for people that are white, mm -hmm. that are wealthy, uh, and that can uh, sustain their own livelihoods and so on, yeah. So in a nutshell, the DA's uh, bid to have the uh, Provincial Powers Bill implemented, it wouldn't assist in terms of uh, eradicating uh, the triple challenges of unemployment inequality as well. <laughs> it won't assist, I just, and I'm laughing because it's mm -hmm. just a, a you know, sensation-seeking bull. Uh, if you attended mm -hmm. some of the public hearings, I attended public hearings in Mossel Bay, mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the, the outcry from the community where they say, no, we reject this bill. In some uh, uh, towns, they, uh, uh, there was an, uh, uh, violence erupted in some towns because yeah. people are opposed to this bill, to this uh, provincial powers bill. People are opposed to be governed in a homeland like the Western Cape, uh, because we know our apartheid past. We know what white South Africa has so done So you define the Western Cape as a homeland? Well, this is what they're trying to do. <laughs> yeah. It's vividly clear that they're sure. trying to create this hype of a homeland. Uh, th therefore, they want uh, policing powers. They want to have a special bill for provincial powers. They want to govern their own budgets. They want to have their own harbors mm -hmm. exclusive away from the rest of South Africa. I mean, uh, uh, Titus, this is, uh, this is all signs uh, pointing to the DA wanting to establish a homeland. And this homeland will only benefit the already, uh, you know, halves. Uh, the have-nots will not benefit from this type of homeland. Uh, and so we are, we are uh, opposed, mm -hmm. vehemently opposed uh, to the creation of a, of a homeland. And let me just take you back to the, to the history where we're coming from. Mm -hmm. You know, we're coming out of uh, 380 years of slavery, enslavement, oh, yeah. and discrimination and apartheid. 
And these people that discriminated against us, those people were all church people. They were all Christians, these people. Uh, and no, nothing in their minds told them that other people of color, whether black or colored or Indian, they are also God's creation. Mm -hmm. They thought that they were exclusively white and the blue-eyed boys and girls yeah, of the Dutch. Dutch. Yeah. Yes, the Dutch, yeah. And uh, now, uh, since the dawn of democracy, uh, there is this fight to bring equality, to uh, create employment and so on. Whereas the, uh, in that instance, the ANC has also failed us grossly in that in in that event mm -hmm. uh but uh we'll get to that we'll unpack some of that uh, in terms of the way forward but the the history is we come out of history of apartheid discrimination segregation you know my mom uh, used to work in the kitchen for whites and she had to call such a small little boy boss mm -hmm. and a small little boy boy um, small little girl miss you know it is it is it is it is it is upsetting mm -hmm. when I recall all these things. It is upsetting to know that our mothers that grew us up, that we had have, have respect for, they had to go and show respect by calling another small little white guy boss and miss. Uh, so that that's the history where we're coming from. Mm -hmm. We defy that type of history now at all costs. We don't want mm -hmm. to go back again. Uh, and whether they call it the Western Cape and whether they call it Orania or whether they call it whatever name, if it constitutes apartheid, if it smells <clears throat> discrimination, mm -hmm. if, it's, if it reeks, uh, you know, going back to the bars and miss, then we say no, we say no, emphatically no, we don't want to live in a homeland mm -hmm. governed by white only. Yeah. And let me take you further. They, they used to, and this is, this is the gospel truth, what they do in councils and even in the provin provincial governments, they will always tell you about a caucus position when they take a, a, a certain decision on an item serving in council or in the provincial government. Mm -hmm. The caucus position is a position that was uh, thought out, originates from the headquarters where whites are in charge and uh, colors are used in their councils and all over where they serve at stooges as voting fathers, uh, you know, and they uh, merely simply just raise their hands and say, we agree. Uh, we take the issue of land, for instance, uh, mm -hmm. the sale of land, as much as we talk about, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 taking the land back to the, to the original people of our mm -hmm. country, to the blacks and the colored people, the more they push for developments and mighty developments, mega developments. Uh, and those are land, that's land that, that should have been used for housing, for social development in our community and so on. But they're bringing business in uh, under the pretense of job creation. Many of these businesses, <coughs> they don't even create jobs. It's businesses that operate on their own, on their own schedules and so on. And they even import people to come and work in their companies. So uh, the issue of land is also a critical issue in the Western Cape. Uh, you will see that 72% of this land in our country is owned by white people. Mm -hmm. uh, come to the Western Cape, I would go to say 90, 95% of the land in the Western Cape belongs, it's in the hands of white ownership. Uh, black people uh, have virtually no land in the Western Cape. And that's the type of inequality that we're talking about and we cannot perpetuate that type of inequality. That mm -hmm. We cannot condone that type of inequality. There must be some other kind of program, some mm -hmm. kind of agenda that say, no, let us stop, let us pause, let us reset, uh, and let us do it over so that other people can also share mm -hmm. in the wealth and in the land of our country. And for that matter, the EFF, uh, if, you, if we go into the manifesto, of 2024 of the EFF, mm -hmm. you will see the EFF emphasize the issue of land, uh, that land need, needs to be reversed. The ownership of land needs to be reversed. Mm -hmm. Black people must become owners of land, uh, and we must use land for our own agricultural activities. We must have land to have you know, decent living conditions mm -hmm. And land for security as well. For yeah. security yeah. and to sustain ourselves there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When you look at the Western Cape, it is the British uh, uh, colony, and that's where 
apartheid, in fact, really began. Yeah. When you look at uh, the legacy of the National Party and you look at what the DA seeks to achieve, would you say there are material differences between the National Party and the DA? Would you then say, what the, looking at the status quo, inequality, uh, unemployment as well, would you say the DA was able to, uh, in fact, uh, you know, act in accordance to the new uh, dispensation where it's a non-racial society, where there's equality and all of that. Would you say the DA is heading towards that direction? At Titus, if you compare the DA with the NP, it is basically just the colors that differ from the DA to the NP. The, the Nationalist Party believed in uh, segregation and separate development. Mm -hmm. um, and they... Uh, did not believe that blacks, us as blacks, uh, should be owners of our own business and should own land and so on. It's exactly the same agenda that is being preached by the Democratic Alliance, although they pretend to say we are multiracial, we are interracial. You can call it whatever you like to. Mm -hmm. uh, it is not happening. Uh, if you go to Cape Town, for instance, you will see on the Atlantic seaboard, uh, Clifton, Sea Point, Lundatno, all those type of places, exclusive to whites. Here and there you will see a black person that owns something there, but you must be an extreme millionaire to own something there. That is what we call exclusi exclusivity. Uh, <coughs> the, if you take the ownership of land, uh, they, their policies do not make provision uh, for us to speak to the issue of... Uh, access to land, mm -hmm. right? If you go to their councils and their policies, you'll see that their councils make policies that still advance mm -hmm. uh, whites and white business and white interest. Uh, and they don't understand. I served in George Council for 12 years. I served on the district council also for almost the same time. And the more you tell them that we need to eradicate the inequality, the more they take the land to wealthy and rich whites mm -hmm. and businesses, and they don't care uh, at all about blacks being owners of the land in the Western Cape. The statistics speak, speak for itself. Mm -hmm. so, segregation, that separate development, uh, go to the ownership of business in the Western Cape. You'll see, uh, you, the, the, even in this democratic dispensation, there was not a sizable chunk of mm -hmm. black people that own business uh, in in the Western Cape. Mm -hmm. uh, in, 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 in comparison with your other provinces where black people are afforded the opportunity to own and possess land in other provinces as well. Mm -hmm. So if you ask me, uh, remember that the, that the NP thrived in the Western Cape. The NP thrived in our, in our areas for that matter. Mm -hmm. We've seen them, it was our forefathers <coughs> that supported the NP, it was our forefathers that mm -hmm. were lobbied uh, to lobby other people, to vote for them and to keep them in power. Uh, nothing has changed whatsoever, I can tell you this much. Uh, if you take, for instance, that the, you're talking about the National Party, out of the National Party, out of their system way back, float the tricameral system. Oh yeah, yeah the tricameral and, parliament, yeah. Yes, the tri tricameral parliament. In that mm -hmm. tricameral parliament, you had the House of Representatives, meaning colors, mm -hmm. and then you had the House of uh, Delegates, mm -hmm. meaning the, the Indians. Yes. Blacks were totally yeah. excluded. It was the Indians, the whites, and yeah. the colors. And the colors. Mm -hmm. Blacks were excluded from that, from that arrangement. Uh, and you will know simultaneously at that time, uh, they were, uh, the, the National Party imposed the, the homeland system and your TBV, TBVC states. Mm -hmm. where black people were living and people, uh, black people were virtually relegated to those areas on the outskirts of their own country. Mm -hmm. this, is, this was part of it. Now, if you take the, 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 the colored setup, for instance, colors were represented in that parliament uh, by ministers. The, at the time, it was uh, Alan Hendricks, Chris April, and all those type of guys that were lobbied to serve in the, in the, on the Indian side, it was Rasbanji, uh, that was an Indian from Durban and so on. 
and they had to serve the colored and the Indian interest in that parliament. Yeah. So uh, I, I grapple with the following, and, I, and, 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 and I'm here to be persuaded by, by somebody. Uh, there are parties now suddenly claiming to uh, represent coloreds and coloreds only. And they say coloreds have been disadvantaged uh, and left behind in the new South Africa and so on and so on. I'm trying to understand how is it, how, on, in, in which way were coloreds disadvantaged, uh, you know, on that agenda and that arrangement, if that arrangement was going on at the time because you had ministers representing us in the uh, in the in the parliament, you we had better grants than black people. We had better infrastructure than black people. We had better housing opportunities at at the time than black people. We had running water at uh, at the time. We had uh, toilet facilities mm. uh, at the time. We had our own pieces of land and so on. You were privileged. Uh, at, at that time, you yeah. know, if you take it under the apartheid system. Yeah. So I'm trying to understand how, how were colored people disenfranchised. Yes, when it comes to education, I can agree. We were disenfranchised. Mm -hmm. Education at the time, the, the white NP government prescribed what you can study. Uh, and that time it was a, a, the in thing to study for a, a teaching and then nursing and to be a policeman and all. But we were never allowed to go into the specialist uh, careers, you know, like doctors, like uh, engineers and those type of careers. So there was, there was a, a, some, some kind of apartheid. But if you're talking about infrastructures, by talking about housing opportunities, work, uh, employment opportunities and so on, uh, colors had those opportunities at the mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. The opposite is that blacks were relegated into the outskirts of South Africa where there was no electricity, mm -hmm. uh, there, where there was no proper infrastructure, mm -hmm. you know, all those type of things. Uh, we had electricity uh, maybe later on in the apartheid era. We were uh, uh, given electricity, access to electricity. But I've, in, in 1986, Titus, I have traveled the uh, some of the homelands and some of the far areas in the far north. Mm -hmm. I was a youngster at the time. And I traveled to Kangwan, Laboa, Kazankulu, Chukukuni, to the border of Swaziland. We were busy preaching the gospel at the time. I slept in the houses of black people. I drove on the streets in those areas. Uh, it was just terrible, let me tell you this. There was no infrastructure. Uh, people were there in their homeland status trying to make a living all on their own. Uh, I've seen it with my own eyes as a youngster. And this was ingrained in my mind to say, let us fight for a better South Africa for all people. Mm -hmm. We cannot be separate blacks in this corner, whites in that corner, and coloreds and Indians in that corner. It is not normal. We must normalize our country. We must normalize South Africa so that we have better opportunities, you know, for all of us, for all mm -hmm. people, not just for a chosen few. Mm -hmm. Talking about the chosen uh, few, what is the role of the Patriotic Alliance in the Western Cape? And it, it, it claims to be representing uh, the colored people as people who are, uh, are not represented in the current uh, democratic uh, dispensation. And when you look at the EFF, the EFF, what's good about the EFF is that it is the party for the poor and the marginalized, mostly black people. But even those who are not necessarily black, but if you were somehow marginalized, the EFF is able to come through. That's why the EFF also has got colors in it. There's, there are white people in the EFF. But I want to understand, wh who does the Patriotic Alliance uh, represent in the Western Cape and what agenda are they pushing? Well, they claim to represent uh, the colors exclusively. And the more they are pressurized on social media, or in the media, for that matter, mm -hmm. they shift and change their, their articulation of who they represent, actually. It was first coloreds. They tried to make coloreds the victims, exactly for the reasons that I've, that I've, that I've explained now earlier, where they say that coloreds were disenfranchised and uh, coloreds were left behind, and it's only black people that benefit now and so on. But you will never hear they say uh, white people benefit also. You know, they 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 targeting the black people 
uh, and they co try to compare colors with blacks and where we stand at the moment and the opportunities, which is totally wrong. It is actually a false approach. You cannot, you cannot do that. You are uh, playing on the uh, psychological mood of people and on the emotions of people to, 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 to do that type of comparison. Mm -hmm. It cannot be. Mm -hmm. They claim to, to represent colors. I can tell you now that colors, the eyes of colors have opened. Colors are not going to be uh, pushed into a corner again uh, where they will be used and abused by some political party or politicians mm -hmm. claiming to represent them. Remember in the old apartheid era, it was the, the Labour Party, uh, the coloured Labour Party that said, we represent you as coloureds. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, in the meantime, those guys were just taking care of them and their families and no... Uh, you know, transformation in our communities. Mm -hmm. uh, they stood for separate development also because they maintained the system of separate development, colors here and whites there and blacks there. Uh, and then after the Labour Party, there were some other parties that also tried uh, to manipulate the colored vote. It was then the ID, the Independent uh, Democrats of Patricia mm -hmm. de Lille, uh, where they now say, we are here for the colors. That party has closed down. They have now become good to the dissolutionment of colored people that voted for them. And now it, it, you have the PA on the, on the stage claiming to represent colors. But you can go countrywide and say and see uh, that they're trying to get a footprint, but they don't have a footprint. The reason why they don't have mm -hmm. a solid footprint is because we don't know what they stand for, Titus. Mm -hmm. We don't know what they stand for. Remember when Helen Zeller was 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 punted about black economic empowerment? Mm -hmm. She came out with the things to say, uh, no, we don't believe in empowerment. We believe in black advancement. Now, advancement is huge. It's open. It's broad. How do you advance a black? What are the criteria that you set to advance black people, mm -hmm. to bring them out of poverty? So the the, the comparison here or the, 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 the emphasis here mm -hmm. is that if you have colors and you paint them all in one corner, what do you do with them? You, you say we are colors, uh, uh, we want our own uh, arrangements, and uh, we want our own factories, and we want our own, and so on and so on. And so you're cutting yourself off, off from the mainstream in the country. You are not integrating, you are not transforming, you are not uh, coming, uh, you know, to... Uh, to the to the process of reconciliation with other races, uh, to say we are one South Africa, we are one nation, we must take hands. You cannot just proclaim a political agenda just for blacks or whites or coloreds or Indians. Mm -hmm. It is totally wrong. It is in opposition with the spirit of our constitution, one South Africa, one nation. And therefore, it brings me to this point, uh, Titus. Mm -hmm. This is exactly why I have joined the EFF. I have joined the EFF because the EFF has got an agenda for the entire country, for all races, for women, for children, for men, for black, for white, for every nation in South Africa. Yes. The EFF has got an agenda. The agenda is to transform our country to the better. Mm -hmm. The EFF's agenda is to eradicate unemployment, inequalities, this, any form of discrimination. This is what triggered my heart to say, let me join the EFF. This is what we want. And by the way, let me tell you, our children, my children and their children, they are learned. They, they have degrees. They were to universities. They are no longer interested in this racial approach uh, because they've been in university with other students, with blacks. They have discovered that black people are the same people as what they are, as the same blood. The, they speak the same language. They have the mm -hmm. same habits, the same traditions, the same intellectual capacity. Mm -hmm. There is no difference. They also, our children also understand that black people are created by the same God that created them. And therefore I speak uh, really with authority on this matter, mm -hmm. with energy on this matter, because we must do away from this racial lines in our country where we, where we, where we create division 
And by creating division, by extension, we actually robbing our children of opportunities by excluding them from the mainstream South Africa. Mm -hmm. I've joined the EFF for these opportunities. The name says Economic Freedom Fighters. Mm -hmm. It is, you know, let me just, let me just tell you this. Mm -hmm. You, you go into our communities, mm -hmm. black and, and colored communities, and you will see a, a, a gross amount of our people uh, are, are, are uneducated or semi-literate. Mm -hmm. They did not have the opportunity to uh, do the matric and to go to university. Mm -hmm. Thousands, millions of our people. And that is due to the apartheid system. That is due to the fact that our mothers had to go out of school on an early age and they had to go and work in the kitchens of white people, mm -hmm. on the farms of white farmers and so on. Now, how do you bring those people? That's a generation that dealt with their own issues in the past 40, 50, 60 years ago. How do you bring them on a level that they can enjoy equal opportunities with all other South Africans? Mm -hmm. what, what, what invited me to this party, to the EFF, is that they talk about economic opportunities, economic opportunities for all people. In other words, an auntie that left school in standard two or in standard four or in standard six, that auntie will also now have the opportunity to be an entrepreneur because many of these people are talented and their talents can take them to business. We've seen mm -hmm. it in our country. They can mm -hmm. be developed uh, you know, as successful business people, mm -hmm. they also now have the opportunity to come into the market through this economic development. Mm -hmm. And this is exactly what the EFF is preaching. Mm -hmm. There is no discrimination. You can, you, can, you, 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 you can be out of school in step A, standard two, standard four, standard five. If you can make a living as an entrepreneur, the opportunities are there for you. The EFF is promising that to mm -hmm. our nation, to our disadvantaged people and to those that were left behind in an apartheid system to bring about. In other words, if that auntie is now selling her stuff on the market, mm -hmm. she'd be able to afford her child to go to a decent school and to go to a decent university. Mm -hmm. And this is exactly what we want. We want to build a better nation, a better people, a quality people, so that we don't walk around. Our children must also not walk around inferior because they are not educated, because they are not the same color as their white counterparts and so on. No, it's, mm -hmm. this, it's, this, it's the education that will, that, will, that will lift them up in life. It's the business opportunities. It's the economic opportunities. Mm -hmm. And that will restore their dignity in our country. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And th uh, 2024 marks uh, 30 years since uh, the attainment of political freedom. And the EFF seeks to attain in 2024 uh, elections, uh, economic freedom. Clearly, the DA is uh, a wolf in a sheep's clothing. <laughs> now, I want to understand, when you left your, your former party, uh, BPI, PBI. Yeah, PBI. Yes. What 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 stance were you taking? Uh, were you fighting the DA? If so, now that you have joined the EFF, how are you planning to bolster? Uh, and also, how do you think we can, uh, in fact, take the DA in the Western Cape out of power? Yeah, thank you for the question, Titus. Mm -hmm. the, the PBI uh, was uh, uh, founded by myself and my wife uh, okay. because we saw the gap, the... There was a huge gap, the ANC, uh, the party that was supposed to take us to our promised land. They did not look after us anymore, and they forsaken their promises. And I said, people, can we start something here that also look after people here that fall through this gap? Not just colored people. Mm -hmm. People of all races, you can go there and visit the PBI and see there are whites and blacks and even Indians in that party. So we started up with, uh, in the 2016, 2011 election with one councillor, then in the 2016, uh, two councillors, and 2021 we've lifted it to eight councillors, uh, of whom two serve in the district municipality, five in the George municipality, and one as a deputy mayor in the Neisner municipality. And then uh, after that, after that election, I felt that uh, it's time for me to move on. I have uh, taken this party, you know, to success, uh, but this party is doing well on a local level.
But it, during my term in that uh, party and on those councils, I have fiercely and vehemently opposed the neoliberal policies uh, of the Democratic Alliance, the apartheid policies of the Democratic Alliance. Uh, and uh, I have uh, opposed the the, the 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 notion of separate development and the uh, privilege, you know, that they give to whites and so on. We have made huge inroads, huge strides in fighting against these racist tendencies mm -hmm. in both the district municipality as well as in the George City Council. It is a tough job, I must tell you, because when you when you fight with whites in one council their minds are conditioned mm -hmm. to privilege. Mm -hmm. They don't even think about people that are underprivileged and people that have been left behind because of their own making, because of the apartheid. They don't even think about that. Mm -hmm. So it's for you to stand up and to articulate for the people that, that were left behind. Mm -hmm. We have succeeded in transforming policies, in shifting you know, the, the emphasis of certain things. Uh, on those councils. Be that as it may, I have then decided I have done enough. I've given the party over to capable leadership. And then I decided to join the EFF. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, I didn't just uh, put up my hand one day to say I want to join the EFF. It was uh, this partnership came, th this, this, this membership came through a partnership uh, that was established in the region of George and in the entire Southern Cape mm -hmm. by the now, the current uh, provincial secretary, Mbulele Mgwala, mm -hmm. uh, because we were working side by side on issues of inequality and discrimination. Each time when there was a problem in the area, I would call on Mbulele of the EFF, uh, and he would join and he would bring the forces and the ground forces and we would address the issues mm -hmm. uh, that I had, and the workers' issues, the issues of land and so on. And then later on, we spoke about joining the EFF. Uh, I started to believe more and more. They didn't, uh, uh, they didn't release their grip to invite me. Uh, in fact, they tightened the grip to say the EFF is the party for you. The language that you speak is our language and so on. And so they have eventually persuaded me, together with the current chairperson, uh, Unati Satani, mm -hmm. Uh, we had meetings, we had engagements, and then the rest is history. Uh, and then I started to join the EFF. Uh, I am pretty comfortable in the EFF as a colored person. Let me emphasize that. There, there's no truth in it that they say that the EFF is just for black people. It is totally false. It's devoid of all truth. In the EFF, you can do for your people more. I've decided to join the EFF because on this platform where I serve now, I've been privileged to be afforded an opportunity by the EFF to serve on the level of parliament. And on this level of parliament, I can do much, much, much more for all people. Mm -hmm. And this is what I've been doing at the moment. I am doing it at the moment, articulating for our people, influencing legislation and policy and strategies and so on. So yes, uh, let me just address for a moment the issue of uh, the uh, where some people, some false prophets go around and say uh, the EFF is just for black people. Mm -hmm. The CIC has recently made a statement, a public statement to say, uh, we cannot within 10 years not have one white person and then uh, no Indian or, yeah, no Indian person. And then he said, we have colors, but we can have more colors. You know, it's an open public statement. Speaking of a man's heart mm -hmm. that can see the need for more representation of all communities. A man's heart that opens up opportunities for all communities. It's even on the EFF's constitution, by the way. It's on the constitution, it's also mm -hmm. in, yeah. So this is, those are the, the, the things that invited me. Mm -hmm. In my, in my, in, in my, in my, in my uh, uh, social environment with EFF MPs, with EFF members and ground forces, I, I'm treated as a person. I'm not treated as a colored, I'm treated as a human being. Uh, my contributions are taken into consideration. Uh, they look at me as a human being created by God, uh, equally listen to me, uh, you know, uh, of what I'm saying in meetings, wherever I stand. So I am not treated inferior. I shift more things on this platform than I have shifted ever in my life. Mm 
mm-hmm. uh, because I've been afforded to serve on the police committee for the EFF and for our country. I've also been allocated as an alternative member, alternate member on the uh, COCTA, uh, Corporate Governance and Traditional Affairs. And yes, we do a lot of things. Uh, we shift a lot of, lot of things. We influence a lot of things on those platforms, and we do more and more and more for our people. Mm-hmm. Let me give you a practical example. La- I, I am actually from George in the Western Cape. Okay. So, and there's a small town where I grew up uh, called Packelsdorp. In Packelsdorp, in my own hometown, last year, November 2023, there were three murders in two weeks' time. They're mm-hmm. just in Packelsdorp. Now, George is big. George has got... Park Dean, Lavalia, Rochemore, Cornwall, all mm-hmm. those type of places, Temberlet and so on. But in Packersop alone, there were three murders. And then I, I was so upset about this because it was once a peaceful town mm-hmm. uh, where I grew up. We could walk to the shop, you know, bare feet and nobody would be- bother you, would rob you and so on. Mm-hmm. This particular occasion, three murders in two, two of those guys were youngsters. One was 18 years, and I think the other one was 20. other one was in his 50s. I took this matter to, to the parliamentary committee because there was an outcry uh, from the side of the community because of the, of the uh, absence of policing and the visibility of police. Mm-hmm. So I took it to parliament, to the committee. I've articulated, I've uh, submitted the item, I've elaborated on the item, and the parliamentary committee has listened. Mm-hmm. So much so that they allocated maximum resources throughout the festive season, and that program is still ongoing. They have uh, allocated more resources, more manpower, uh, more specialized <coughs> units, and the people of the Southern Cape, mm-hmm. the entire Southern Cape, had a more peaceful uh, festive season than ever before. And they can testify to this. It is rife on Facebook. They are talking about this. And this is what we, I believe, when you are appointed or allocated or afforded an opportunity in a position, to you must to serve, you must make the most of it. Don't go there to serve yourself and your family. Serve the community uh, and do the party pride, proud, the party that has appointed you. In this instance, the EFF has appointed me, has afforded me. I'm doing the EFF proud because the EFF's agenda is clear that they want to clamp down on crime. They have a plan. The EFF has got a plan for, 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 to fight crime, Titus. Yeah. Uh, if you ask me what is the plan, I can, I can unpack this for you. Absolutely. Uh, and, and, and I'm sitting here as a proud member to say, <laughs> let yeah. me unpack it for you. You know that sure. the CIC at the launch of the election manifesto has announced that by the end of 2026, when the EFF, not, not, not if, but when the EFF comes into power, the EFF will, by the end of 2026, appoint 100,000 extra policemen in mm. South Africa. Now, that's a huge amount. If you take what uh, the President Ramaphosa has announced recently, his mind stuck, went stuck at uh, 10,000 police officers only. While ca- crime is escalating, crime is rife in our communities, and this is why the EFF has said that we will appoint 100,000 uh, police officers. Mm-hmm. That's the first thing. The second thing is that the CIC has announced that we will introduce again food patrols, food patrols in densely populated communities. Now, I mean, uh, that must sound like Christmas in the ear, sound in the ear of people. Food patrols of qualified, trained policemen with weapons, with their logistic support, and so on, it will make a huge dent. Uh, you know, in the fighting crime, it will assist greatly uh, and uh, communities will be satisfied because of the visibility of police. Another another great, great initiative mm-hmm. uh, announced by the CIC was to say that the EFF will integrate reservists, people that are currently serving as reservists, they will be integrated into the reserve force. Absolutely. Uh, that's great. That is that is that is that is profound. Mm-hmm. A profound announcement. Uh, it means that thousands of reservists, even people that are jobless at the moment, will be afforded a job opportunity mm-hmm. in a formal police force. Mm-hmm. Uh, that is great. Uh, there are a number of other issues. There's a 67-pointer yeah. plan 
that the that the the the, the EFS uh, has as has as crafted uh, in the election manifesto to satisfy to speak to crime uh, to improve the levels for instance of DNA tests for instance course, yes. uh, people are waiting long from laboratories for blood tests and uh, when the rape kits are absent at police stations and so on. The EFF has spoken about it. The CIC has addressed it uh, in his man election manifesto. And I think uh, it should be applauded. All those type of initiatives should be applauded. One of the other great initiatives will be uh, to reward people uh, that expose criminals in their communities. They will be paid. All the whistleblowers. The whistleblowers will be mm. incentivized. Uh, 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 yes. Mm -hmm. So, 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 this is what we need of uh, in order to clamp down on crime. This thing of white collar crime and corruption, uh, you know, uh, cases that are taking so long uh, to come before courts. No, we will expedite. The EFF mm -hmm. will expedite those type of investigations by bringing in capable people that understand uh, the commercial. Uh, 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 Factors of, of, of crime, the commercial, uh, yeah, understand the commerce of crime and so yeah. on, mm -hmm. uh, for the lack of a better word. Yeah. But yes, to in order to, 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 to bring a capable case, an understandable case and a good case to the courts of law, yeah. Mm -hmm. And of course, as we continue to unpack the EFF uh, manifesto, the EFF, of course, uh, seeks to uh, base its approach uh, to policing on the seven cardinal pillars uh of open, yeah. accountable, and corrupt-free yes. uh, government. Now, when you look at the the, the Western Cape, what are the uh, hotspot areas when we look at uh, crime such as uh, gangsterism? Undoubtedly, the hotspot areas are colored areas uh, where gangsterism is prevalent. You look in the Western Cape, for instance, to your Menenbergs, to your Mitchell's Plain. <coughs> Uh, to your uh, Hanover Parks, mm -hmm. uh, obviously to your Google Letters and so on. I am not convinced that gangsterism is so prevalent in the black communities than in the, in the colored communities. In the colored communities, it's more organized. In Why is that the case? Why are colored people that violent? Colored people are in nature not violent people. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that much. We are peaceful people and loving people. Uh, but it's because of the, uh, you know, this, 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 this legacy, this legacy, and I know many people don't want to hear this, but it's the legacy of apartheid. Okay. That, oh, yes. The legacy of apartheid that okay. keep our people uneducated. Uh, an uneducated person. It is more difficult for an uneducated person to understand something, to, 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 to be accountable do something because they don't have that understanding of the situation. They can't see the situation. They can't predict the situation. They can't, for instance, and I like to explain this on a, in a layman's language, they, they think it's smart to walk around with a knife, but they cannot anticipate in their narrow mind that when I stab somebody, there is a possibility that this person may die. Mm -hmm or I will go to jail. Because once you anticipate that as a decent person and as an educated person, you will say, no, I will not stab a person, or I will not shoot a person, because there will be fatalities when I do this. Mm -hmm. So it's a lack of education. It is the lack of that understanding that my actions will cause, you know, some kind of grief to the community and damage. Mm -hmm. Uh, it is also the, the, the prevalence of gangsterism uh, uh, is also attributed to the fact that people are poor. Oh, yes. Poverty is a, a huge poverty, driver. Poverty, yes. It's a huge driver. Mm -hmm. So instead of me being jobless, rather go and join a gang where I can profit from. Profit from robberies, car hijacking, you know, all those type of things. Mm -hmm. At least I will come home with something tonight. Mm -hmm. Drug dealing, all those type of things. Mm -hmm. So uh, those are the type of issues that influence gangsterism. I'm not a, a fundi on this, 
But those are the type of issues that influence the prevalence of gangsterism in our communities. Uh, and therefore, the youth are joining gangsterism and gangsters in droves. Mm -hmm. Yet these people are our own people, Titus. Mm -hmm. They are our own children. They are our own families. They are our own neighbors and so on. They are amongst us. So we're living in that reality. That's a reality. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are the type of issues that need to be addressed. So what the EFF, and this is what I like about this manifesto, mm -hmm. the EFF said we will, we understand, this is what the EFF said, we understand that all these issues have been caused by social ills. It's in the, it's in the manifesto. Yes. We understand the social ills. We understand illiteracy. We understand poverty, we understand inequality, and so on and so on. So we must address the social ills first. Mm -hmm. Sending people to school, making sure that people have food on the table, uh, making sure that people are educated, making sure that people have employment, and not this false pretense of media campaign saying that people, most people are, are, are employed in the Western Cape while people are not employed. Most people are not employed in the Western Cape. Mm -hmm. So those are the type of social ills that we need to address. Then the EFF says, guys, we will then establish a special task force, mm -hmm. a special task force that will deal with gangsterism. And this is what we, this is long overdue. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the EFF should be commended uh, for that initiative, yeah. It is long overdue that you have a dedicated special task force that operates in your communities where gangsters are prevalent, where they are standing on the corners, where people are being robbed, where they sell drugs and so on. That dedicated task force, especially highly trained task force, must make sure that those gangsters, their space is narrowed within every community, Titus. Yes. And another interesting commitment from the EFF manifesto is that those crimes that are excluded from the presidential pardon such as sexual offenses should in fact be excluded from parole and that goes uh, across uh, the board now I want this is why uh, just on that point mm -hmm. this is why the EFF is proposing minimum sentences oh yes for those type of crimes in some instances it's 25 years minimum mm -hmm. and in some instances instances is life minimum mm -hmm. And that, is, that should also be commendable because this is what will be imposed in, uh, 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 or included into legislation. The courts will have no choice uh, but to uh, impose that type of legislation uh, in comparison with the crime committed here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when we look at uh, the, the Western Cape, uh, women are, and children are vulnerable to this kind of crimes, uh, sexual offences. Do you think the DA is turning a blind eye in black uh, communities? Do you think the DA has no interest in policing uh, black communities? The, you see, the difference here is the, the DA tries to compete with the national government when it comes to policing. Mm -hmm. uh, they try to, to introduce what, they, what we call a concurrent police force in their law enforcement. You know, they have a law enforcement that they try to make equivalent to your national police force. But those, that law enforcement does not have the powers uh, what police, uh, uh, national police powers <coughs> have. Mm -hmm. The DA tried to get grandstand on this issue. The DA does not have the power. They, does not have the, they do not have the political will. Mm -hmm. And they do not have... Uh, they do not allocate the resources uh, to fighting this type of crime in our communities. Mm -hmm. Because if they had an interest to fight crime, they would allocate bigger budgets to your CPFs, to assist your neighborhoods, and to all other crime-fighting initiatives in your area. Instead, what they do, they concentrate on, on farm watches. Mm. You know, they strengthen the arms of farm watchers and so on, and they and they and they and they let alone the CPFs and 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 they they give them little money to operate. If I was, for instance, in a government, I would say, let us take bring up our CPFs where people are willing mm -hmm. to sacrifice their time in neighborhood watchers, sacrifice their time, pay these people stipends, 
uh, invite them, make, the, make it inviting for them to surf on those structures in order to fight crime, but also supply and provide them with the resources like vans, like vehicles, uh, like uniforms, and so on and so on. It's not happening in the Western Cape. Mm-hmm. So uh, this is why we say there's a reluctance from the Western Cape government. But if you look at it politically, it, it suits the political agenda of the DA, yeah. of the DA when uh, people are, you know, living in crime-infested areas, mm. when people are living in uh, uh, overcrowded housing houses, because it still perpetuates this culture uh, of dependency. Mm-hmm. You see, and as long as they they can keep, or they thought, as long as they can keep colored people under the culture of dependency, uh, those people will still vote for them, you know? But now the barrier has broken. You know, they can no longer keep people under that type of enslavement. People are looking for other options. If I must tell you, I am inundated, every day inundated with people across the Western Cape wanting to join the EFF. People are looking for another a different political home away from the DA, away from the ANC, away from the PA and all those other parties. People are looking for a party that can bring them out of the Egypt culture, mm-hmm. out of slavery, out of enslavement, out of poverty. And people have found the home, the EFF as a home, a political home for them going into 2024. Yeah, The EFF is going to make massive inroads in colored communities. We, we must not be misled or deceived by uh, statistics coming out now of by-elections and so on. The, there's a tendency of some political parties flooding some wards, uh, you know, with their cadres and uh, 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 transporting people in, busing them in from other areas mm-hmm. uh, in order for them to be in every street and intimidating people. This will not be able to happen in the national provincial elections now because people will have to concentrate on their own towns. Mm-hmm. So the true figures will now, the true results will now be showed uh, when the results are coming out in the 2024 election. You will see there will be a massive, a massive rise in colored support uh, towards the EFF because colors are looking uh, for a new political home. Why is it that the end or the rate of crime is relatively low in uh, white communities? Because if you look at the stats, uh, white communities, in the, especially in the Western Cape, do not uh, bear the brunt uh, of crime the same way black communities do. They, it's because they are more developed. Uh, that's the thing that we used to, to articulate in the old uh, in the freedom struggle, that we say we are not a society yet. You know, whites live in a society. Mm-hmm. We still live in communities. So a society sorted out, like you see your Houghtons and your sea points and those, mm-hmm. they are sorted out. They have uh, houses, they have proper neighborhood watches, mm-hmm. they have proper functional CPFs, they have proper resources in those areas, and they have money mm-hmm. to pay for it. In our communities, we are dependent on government because we cannot afford all those type of extra, so to speak. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and therefore I am uh, encouraged by the initiative announced by the EFF. It will make a huge difference to pull up your reservists, to give more strength to your neighborhood watchers, mm-hmm. to give more power to the CPFs mm-hmm. uh, so that the issue of crime can be addressed mm-hmm. finally. But whites benefit from their resources, from their wealth, and they can keep people out. But there's another thing happening in the Western Cape. Uh, it's where, and, 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 and I've sent a video two days ago or yesterday to the National Police Commissioner and to the minister and all, all other office bearers with regard to what's mm-hmm. happening. In George, mm-hmm. a group of whites, call them uh, vigilantes, mm-hmm. they wear balaclavas in a specific ward. Oh, yeah, I saw that. Yeah. yeah in Dennerwood, and on refuse removal days, they chase away black people and colored people out of the areas. They assault people, severely 
assault people and they don't want people of color in that ward. Mm -hmm. uh, I have now, as an EFF member of parliament, asked for a thorough investigation as we speak right now on this, what's today, the 22nd, mm -hmm. 22nd day of February. The National Commissioner is in George. They have taken this matter so serious when I raised it uh, that they have uh, paid immediate attention to this matter. I have asked for the arrest of these people. Uh, I have asked for charges to be brought against them. And even those in the police force, they do not do what they must do. The commanders of Vispol policing and of police stations, they must be removed from their positions because these things are happening for months and months and months. People are... Uh, 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 crying on Facebook about this and the police have turned a blind eye uh, to this. So now we have taken it to the top. Mm -hmm. uh, we expect results. But this is what they do in, 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 in those areas. Mm -hmm. They operate with private security companies. Private security companies, it's like in the old, old days where they ask whether you have a pass to be uh, in that area, where do you work, where's the house of your missus, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and all those type of things. It's movement it, restrictions. It's movement restriction. Mm -hmm. It cannot be allowed in a democratic constitutional arrangement, uh, a democratic South Africa. Mm -hmm. It cannot be allowed. The struggle was too dear. It was too expensive. Blood has flowed. People have lost their lives in the struggle because they believed in the objective of a free and democratic, non-discriminatory South Africa. How can we allow this? We dare not allow this. We must pave the way for our children and their children to come so that they live in a better and safer South Africa. Mm -hmm. The DA has failed in its bid to uh, declare the ANC's policy on CADA deployment unconstitutional. But if you look at it, the DA in Western Cape as well has, has got similar approach uh, to cater deployment. It deploys some of its uh, members, as it were. Yeah, the <laughs> I can almost call it the top point of hypocrisy, what the DA has done with the cater deployment uh, issue of the ANC. Mm -hmm. uh, the DA is doing exactly the same in the Western Cape. I come from a municipality where the DA before they appointed a, a qualified black director, mm -hmm. they must first obtain permission or consent for that matter from their FedEx. There's a letter surfacing uh, even on social media with regard to that. Now, what they're trying to do there is they say, although this guy is qualified, we must first ascertain whether he serves the interest of our party in alignment with our constitution, what we want to achieve. If that is not cater deployment, then I don't want to be Virgil Herica. It is cater deployment. They even do it with the EPWP workers. They use those people They're all mm -hmm. the time for canvassing on the streets uh, and lobbying votes and so on. And then afterwards, they appoint those people in EPWP positions uh, and trying to up their votes. It, this is cater deployment. When you bring people in that canvass for you, that work for you, uh, and you afford them jobs, you put them in positions. That's mm -hmm. cater deployment. Mm -hmm. So the DA is doing exactly what the ANC has done. This is why it's hypocritic. This is why they failed yesterday uh, in the, uh, I think it's in the Supreme Court or in the High Court, mm -hmm. that they failed with the application to declare, uh, to apply to the Constitutional Court to de declare uh, cater deployment unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. The judges have emphatically, a full bench of judges have said no. You are doing exactly the same. You cannot take it to the Constitutional Court. Mm -hmm. So yes, cater deployment is prevalent in the Western Cape. If they don't like you, I can tell you some stories now as we speak as to how they don't want to employ a colored, a colored a director for the Department of Electricity in George, in the city of George. The guy is fully, fully qualified. He works at, an, at, at a nearby town as a director. They cannot provide valid reasons as to why they don't want to employ that guy. Mm -hmm. uh, but this guy is one of the most up and running colored directors in that area. Uh, he's a guy that can stand his ground. He uses his own mind. He's not a stooge. The DA wants the opposite. They want stooges. They want yes men. They want people to say yes all the time. They dance according to their tune and that sing according to the hymn book. This guy doesn't want, and this is why they don't want to appoint those type of people. That is cater deployment. Say, that advertisement 
for that position is going out now for the third time, I think. Mm. The cost is in the vicinity of approximately 250,000 rand already. It's taxpayers' money, but they waste that money, but they will go and search for their type of yes men until they get their yes men. Mm. Kada deployment is rife in the Western Cape. Don't be deceived. I see some of black people in the northern provinces here in Gauteng and uh, Northwest and all over. Ah, uh, they also uh, uh, say, uh, ah, but the Western Cape looks better. And the Western Cape is worse off than ever. Let me shock you. Yeah. You must come and see our circumstances. See the circumstances of black people. It's appalling. Yeah. Uh, come and see the circumstances of uh, colored people. Uh, come and see the separate development. Come and see the gross levels of, of, of segregation uh, between racial groups. Come and see how jobs are reserved for whites and high-level jobs reserved for whites and the mediocre positions for your colored people and for your black people and so on. Come and see it. Come and see the gross amount of inequality in the Western Cape. There's no other place that you will see it. You will see it in the Western Cape. Hey, Mr. Dubula Inyanga, John Steinhazen is a flip-flop of note. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is for sure. <laughs> yeah, what do you make of the impeachment of uh, Judge President, uh, Judge Slope? Yeah, well, I was uh, live in that parliament yesterday uh, when that, uh, this, uh, that item was brought by the African National Congress. Mm -hmm. Not only of John, uh, Judge Slope, but also Judge Motala. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know what, what, what grieved me? These guys are highly educated judges. They were entrusted for many years to sit on the bench and their judgments were tested, tried and tested, and they were the best judges. They were some of the best scholars. Mm -hmm. What grieved me was the energy in which ANC MPs brought those items to the parliament. They spoke with zeal and energy as if they rejoice to impeach those judges. Personally, my view is, and this is what the EFF, uh, by word of uh, advocate, fighter advocate uh, Amkwabani has said, she has outlined the, uh, the reference and the, uh, yes, of what has transpired up until thus far. Mm -hmm. And it's, it, it, is, it is in total contrast of what other people have said. And I believe her version, because this is the version that we have witnessed in the media also. But if you ask me personally, I, 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 I'm a man of grace, mm -hmm. particularly when, when the stakes are high. I, we don't condone the wrong. We don't condone uh, corruption. We don't condone all those type of things. We say you must have grace of, on people and you must be consistent uh, when you implement those type uh, of judgments, of impeachments on people. Mm -hmm. uh, your processes must be fair. Mm -hmm. uh, the, and, and then the most important thing in that case is that you cannot try people twice for the same thing. In the one instance, the Judge Motala has paid 1, 1, 2 something million to the Judicial Services Commission. On the other hand, he was tried in a court of law. On the other hand, he was tried by the JSC. On the other hand, he was impeached by Parliament. Mm -hmm. we, we, we are here to understand those type of processes. The same with Judge Lope. Uh, they are taking brilliant legal minds off the market uh, we thought that the process could have been treated much better mm -hmm. than uh, what they have done. You don't rejoice in the downfall of other people. You don't marginalize people and you don't get at people uh, by abusing processes uh, in order to get rid of people. Uh, it is the wrong approach. We do not agree with this. Mm -hmm. The EFF has not agreed with that approach yesterday. Uh, and you cannot apply those type of measures uh, you know, by double jeopardy, by uh, trying people twice, by putting them through all these hardships uh, and then eventually come to impeach them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
soldiers, the army were once deployed in the Cape Flat to deal with uh, crime. Is that the only solution to beef up policing by bringing in uh, the army? Clearly the army has little job to do because if now they have to come in, who's securing, um, you know, or who's saving the purpose of being the last, uh, you know, uh, last... Um, uh, line of defense, so yeah. to speak. Now, in the Cape Flats and other areas in the Western Cape, what could be the way forward? How can we uh, increase or uh, intensify policing in that area? Titus, the, the, the difference here is that the army is trained to do war. Mm -hmm. And the police are trained to do uh, <coughs> policing in terms of Section 205 of the Constitution, to fight mm -hmm. crime uh, and to fight the, the criminals on the streets. Mm -hmm. So you cannot deploy the army in a normal society because they their agenda is war. Mm -hmm. Their mindset is war. It's trained. We, it brings us to this point where we say in alignment with the EFF's Constitution is to increase the the amount of police, men and women, mm -hmm. on the streets in your areas of crime. In other words, to distribute equitably according to the hotspots, your police, women and men, and the presence of police. But not only the presence and the visibility. Yes, the visibility is in very important, mm -hmm. of critical importance, but... We must beef up the, the level of investigation. Oh, yeah. Uh, many of these cases are being investigated. And they take time sometimes. Take time, many months, mm -hmm. just to come into a court of law and to fall through the, mat, to, through the carpets. Uh, because the defense poke holes in those type of investigations. Mm -hmm. So we must... Uh, train detectives on a high level uh, comprehensively with all types of methods methods of investigation. Mm -hmm. And even if it means that you need to import some experts from elsewhere, you will have to do it. If you will have to draw some experts from universities and so on, you will have to do it. But we must up the quality of investigators that's the second point. The third point is, and the most important point is, we must address the social ills in the communities. Mm -hmm. Because once you address all the issues that we've spoken previously about, you won't have all these type of gangsters, mm -hmm. drug users, uh, shabins, uh, drug dealers, mm -hmm. you know, all these type of gangsters and uh, scholars, you won't have on the streets anymore. Once you put people in jobs, once you afford them opportunity to be educated, and once they can generate and earn their own money, they will not be interested in crime anymore. So this is why we say the next generation, this generation that we're grooming now, that mm -hmm. we're growing now, this generation must be able to be self-sustainable. They must be educated. They must be able to stand on their own legs. They must be afforded work and job opportunities. Mm -hmm. And it brings us to the following point, what the, what the EFF is saying. Mm -hmm. EFF is talking about the industrialization, industrialization yes. uh, uh, of the economy, for instance. That is to bring bolt factories. Uh, that is to invite international investors to our country and this is to create a climate for investment. Mm -hmm. When there's no or little crime, investors are coming into your country. Mm -hmm. And this is what the EFF is trying to do. This, is, this has been announced by the, by the, by the CIC, President Malema. Mm -hmm. So those are the type of initiatives that will give us a better country with a growing economy, with more employment opportunities, and even more entrepreneurial opportunities for people for all people of all races. Mm -hmm. This is what we want. We want to build that type, that type of country, that 
those type of communities uh, where people are self-sustainable uh, and where they can take care of their children in a decent way. Mm-hmm. The date for the elections, the 2024 general and uh, general uh, national and provincial elections has been set out. Uh, are you are you ready uh, to deliver uh, the EFF victory in the Western Cape? What kind of uh, an EFF government would you envision in the Western Cape in as far as policy is concerned? Yeah, well, yeah, Titus, you kept that question for last. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> so, yeah, I can say we are ready. Mm-hmm. Uh, we are ready all over in the Western Cape. We are mobilizing people. Uh, people find the agenda and the manifesto of the EFF inviting. Mm-hmm. And uh, people want leaders that stand in front, that fight, selfless leaders. This is our CIC, and he is imposing upon us to serve selflessly, not to consider your own circumstances first, but to serve the community. He said it several times in several meetings Mm -hmm. that if you must risk your career or your future, you must do it for the sake of your community. Stand for them, speak for them, fight for them, and this is where we are. Mm-hmm. So when we go to knock on the doors of people, what we do, what we already do in any way, people are friendly towards us, inviting, and, and people say, no, we are interested in you. Uh, we want to support the EFF. What do we want to see ultimately uh, in the uh, government to come in the Western Cape? Mm-hmm. The DA has lost it there, as we all know, in terms of the uh, the. Uh, uh, what you call it, Ipsos uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, research? Study, yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. So they've lost it. So a coalition government is awaiting the Western Cape. Uh, and as you know by yourself, the EFF is working with progressive left, uh, left, leftist organizations. Yeah. Uh, that, that Those organizations must have the sole objective to bring our people out of poverty, to address the issue of land, the issue of unemployment, the issue of social upliftment, decent housing opportunities, and so Mm -hmm. on. In terms of what you ask me in terms of crime, after the elections, when we are government, Mm -hmm. yes, we will allocate first and foremost bigger budgets towards training uh, our uh, law enforcement officers, our police officers, assist neighborhood watchers, doesn't matter from what type of community, they black or white or colored communities, uh, as long as we can bring down the level of crime so that we may create safer communities uh, and also invite investment uh, and better living conditions in our communities. We must import uh, specialized units, as we've said. Uh, we will fight, we will get a grip on the issue of gangsterism Mm-hmm. Yes, we will get a grip as the EFF. We promise the electorate that we will get a grip on gangsterism. Uh, and we will eradicate gangsterism totally in every street and every corner of the Western Cape. And that you will do by partnership with the community. You partnering with the church. You partnering with the, the traditional leaders. Mm-hmm. You partner with the education society. You fraternals all over. You partner with them. And therefore, you bring safer communities to the... You, no government can do this alone, Titus. The a government cannot do it alone. The government needs other stakeholders, different stakeholders, mm-hmm. to, to, to buy in, but the government must also be able to invest uh, in every initiative mm-hmm. proposed by other stakeholders as well. Mm-hmm. So we're looking forward to a pretty uh, crime-free uh Western Cape under EFF government, we're looking forward to a beautiful Western Cape. We're looking forward to a Western Cape where our people, our children will walk free in the streets again, will go to the shops, come free uh, without harm, back, uh, you know, from the shop, where they will go out at night to social events, to the discos, to the nightclubs and so on, without being harassed, Mm -hmm. you know, by bullies and cowards on the streets, our people will go to work in the morning, you know, get on taxis and buses uh, without being arrested and robbed on the streets by their cell phones. Mm-hmm. 
uh, with from their cell phones by gangsters and by scullies and by thugs and so on. We're looking forward to a pretty, pretty, pretty safe and sound and secure Western Cape under the EFF government in the Western Cape, yes. Mm-hmm. 2024 is our 1994, indeed. Yes. When we look at the, by virtue of, the political events, the ANC and the DA seem to be in bed together in a number of events. Uh, if you check the impeachment of uh, former public protector Buswem Kwebani, uh, the two judges who were impeached in parliament, uh, Judge Lope. Uh Now, if you look, when you look at those uh, events, it's more likely that the ANC and the DA will be in coalition. Now, what should South African understand from an ANC and DA uh, coalition? Look, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm certain that's the most important question of the entire interview. <coughs> be, because, the, the, yes, it is true mm-hmm. that they have colluded mm-hmm. to impeach the judges and get rid of Advocate Mkubani. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that 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 alone mm-hmm. uh, should uh, should sh- uh, show some red lights to the electorate. Uh, red lights in the sense that we say it's it's dangerous. It is dangerous because here you have two political parties coming from different backgrounds with political ideologies, uh, with total different political agendas, merging, collu- uh, colluding to get rid of the brightest minds in our country. First and foremost. Mm. So the electorate must get ready for a very unstable government. It is not going to be a smooth ride. It is not that they will agree all the time. Remember, there's a different thought of school in the ANC. School of thought in the ANC. Some say the ANC must uh, be in coalition with uh, the leftist parties and progressive alliance parties. Mm -hmm. And some say that they must go with the DA. Okay, so you still have that split in ideology uh, and people that really want to see a different South Africa, those that has, the the type of South Africa that has been envisioned by your Oliver Tambus and your Nelson Mandela's Mm -hmm. and your Walter Sassoulis. Mm -hmm. We have not seen that yet. So yes, there's, there's a school of thought in the ANC that say we want to see it, but there's a school of thought that say, no, we want to work with the DA. And it means that that even though others want to work with the uh, Progressive Alliance, they will be forced into a coalition with a DA and it won't be a smooth ride. If you take the political agenda of the DA, of segregation, of separate development, of white preference and white and all those type of things, it's not going to stand the test of time versus the constitution, for instance, of the ANC. How do you justify the following? When the Freedom Charter says the mineral wealth beneath the soil, the banks and the monopoly industry shall be transferred to the people as a whole. Mm -hmm. How do you justify that ANC versus a capitalist DA? How do you justify this? How how are you going to improve the lives of people Mm -hmm. if you have those two in one camp? Uh, It's going to be a dark day in South Africa when the DA and the ANC merge and form a coalition government, it's going to be a setback for progress, for the gains of the over the over the past thirty years in our constitutional democracy. It's going to be a massive setback because then the DA will get right what they want all the time, and that is their own homeland, their own preference, their own white protection, you know, and and, and all those type of things, at the cost or at the behest of black people, that we don't want in this democratic. South Africa. Mm -hmm. And let me just emphasize again, if I may. Mm -hmm. We we, we again say that the struggle has been expensive. Mm -hmm. Blood has flowed. People have lost their lives. You know, if I sit in this interview now and I get goosebumps, I get goosebumps if I I recall the words of Solomon Mslangu that says that my blood will nourish the three, the tree. It's powerful words. Mm-hmm. He has foreseen it, that his blood will nourish. The... So 
it's blood that has flowed. It's not just objects uh, that were sent to the Galloway. Mm -hmm. it, it was people, it was human beings that paid an expensive price for the freedom and the liberation of our country. Mm -hmm. It was people that stood relentless in the belief that we must be free from white rule, that we must be free from white domination, and that we must be free from capitalist uh, systems in this world mm -hmm. uh, and in South Africa. Uh, the, the blood that flowed, that blood calls out to say, let there be opportunities for all people. Mm -hmm. Let there be equality to all of our people. Mr. Vigil Gherke, thank you very much for making time for us here yes. on the EFF podcast. We have learned quite a lot from uh, the, the, the EFF manifesto on public safety, what the EFF is going to do for the people of South Africa. We really thank you for making time. Thank you very much, Anit. It's a privilege to be here. Thank you very much. The people of South Africa, we have come to the end of uh, today's uh, show, which is centered around the EFF 2024 manifesto. The book that I'm having on my hand is easily accessible on the EFF website. You can go now on uh, effonline.org for you to get to know what is in here. The EFF manifesto is delivered by the uh, CIC Julius Malima in Moses Mabida Stadium. So quite insightful on the issues of uh, public safety. We will continue as the EFF podcast covering all aspects of the EFF manifesto to ensure that indeed this is the time for economic freedom. The election date has been set the 29th of May 2024. Let's all head to the polls and make sure that we vote in the economic freedom fighters. My name is Titus Tsungu. Until we meet again, good day. You can get Kanimaba. Stand up, South Africa. Make sure that South Africa, you are counted with me. Run, South Africa. Stand and make sure that our people understand that the need to be revolution in South Africa is guaranteed that under the EFF, this country will be the better. EFF is a covert thing.